Welcome back, Exile, to another video in Noodle's Complete Lore series. This video is covering Act 3, and it is a doozy, so buckle up and let's get started. When we emerge from the Val Pyramid of Act 2, we find ourselves in the outskirts of the city of Sarn. We follow the Chittis River up north, getting closer to the city's center. On our way, we run into a woman being held hostage by Piety's blackguards. This is Clarissa, an exile of Oriath. When we defeat the blackguards surrounding her, Clarissa tells us that she and her boyfriend Tolman were found by Piety herself, and Piety has taken Tolman. She asks us to find Tolman for her and agrees to meet us at the encampment by the Grand Arena of Sarn. Sarn is the first city founded in the Eternal Empire by the Asmiri Tarkis Veruso, established in 1 IC. Veruso came down from the Asmirian mountain ranges through the Doomlands to Azala Val, where Queen Atziri reigned until the fall of the Val. Sarn is built on these Val ruins. We saw other ruins of the Val in Act 2 as the Val were a powerful, sprawling culture from 900 to 400 BIC. Veruso sealed off everything Val, including the pyramid we escaped from, and banned thaumaturgy and those who meddled with it. The city of Sarn was the seat of the empire until the Purity Rebellion of 1333 IC. Sarn is where the final battle of the Purity Rebellion took place in 1334 IC, with High Templar Vol leading his many armies against Sarn and the reigning emperor Chittis Parandus. Vol gathered support from the Karui, led by Kaum, as well as the Ezemites and the Mariketh. Vol even sowed distrust of Emperor Chittis amongst the common people of the Empire and those concerned with the use of virtue gems and thaumaturgy that Chittis coveted. Now that the High Templars are in power and the Cataclysm has wrecked Rayclast, they rule from Oriath. The Sarn encampment is built near the ruins of the Grand Arena of Sarn, which stands in the middle of Sarn surrounded by the waters of the Chittis River. Within Sarn, there are two temples, one for the sun god Solaris and one for the moon god Lunaris. There is an expansive marketplace, a library, and a cathedral built by Emperor Chittis. Clarissa is at the Sarn encampment along with Hargan, Maramoa, and Grigor. We learn that Clarissa was once into thaumaturgy herself, and has known Piety since before she took the name Piety. Piety, when she was known as Vinya, used to purchase ingredients for thaumaturgy from Clarissa back in Theopolis. Clarissa was exiled to Rayclast because her father gambled away their money and the family had to do illegal work to keep fed. In fact, Hargan helped procure Clarissa and her family this work back in Theopolis. Hargan is an Oriath who seems knowledgeable of black market dealings and the underground, past and present. He's quite jovial, but the others warn you he does not give anything without expecting something in return. Maramoa is a Karui, but was exiled from Oriath as well. Maramoa is a warrior, but she is also extremely knowledgeable about history. Grigor is an Ezemite man who is horribly disfigured from the thaumaturgical experiments Piety practiced on him. He was caught by General Gravisius, one of Piety's blackguards, while trying to find the remains of the fabled Gemling Queen in the Solaris Temple. Gravisius gave Grigor to Piety as his punishment. Clarissa knows General Gravisius as well, from back on Oriath, where he was working for the current ruler, High Templar Dominus. Both Piety and Gravisius are now on Rayclast. Knowing that Piety has Tolman, we exit the Sarn encampment into the slums to find them. We wander past a locked entrance to the sewers and eventually find the crematorium. The crematorium itself is pretty self-explanatory, although it seems to have prison cells as well. When we enter, we can hear screams, which we can presume are Tolman. We find Piety and her black guards around a chair which Tolman has been strapped to. We attack Piety, but at the last minute she escapes once again. Tolman has unfortunately passed, and we retrieve his bracelet to return to Clarissa as proof we had found him. We return Tolman's bracelet and Clarissa gives us keys to the sewer we passed earlier, which can be navigated to get deeper into the city and hopefully find Piety. Hargan tells us if we're going through the sewers to watch out for three platinum busts that a man named Victario, the people's poet, had stolen from Emperor Chittis during the Purity Rebellion and smuggled into the sewers. Fun fact, one of the busts is of Marcius Lionai, the gemling captain defeated by Kaum at Lionai's watch. Victario was a popular poet around the time of the Purity Rebellion, who wrote in support of High Templar Vol and the people. 
He wrote his observations on the power and destruction of the virtue gems that Emperor Chittis so valued. Another fun fact, one of his writings is about Kalisa, the opera singer whose virtue gem became the star of Rayclass that transformed Mervale. Victoria's writings stirred unease in the people about Emperor Chittis and Thaumaturgy, which helped Vol and his Purity Rebellion gain support. Victorio dubbed Emperor Chittis the Monkey King, and we can find graffiti all around Sarn condemning the Monkey King, his gemlings, and his shadow. Victorio was also known for being a thief. So many fun facts. Victorio is the one who stole Malagaro's initial black elixir, created from Malagaro's spike and the baleful gem, that we recreate to kill the tree Lorata and enter the Val ruins. Victorio had operated in these sewers to help the rebellion and spread dissent. In the sewers, we pass a monstrous puckered barricade called the Undying Blockage, which blocks the path to another area of Sarn. For now, we continue to our only exit, which leads us to the Parandus Marketplace. The Marketplace is a sprawling, open-aired location overrun by the Undying, or Undead Gemlings, and living statues. When Emperor Chittis Parandus ruled, he was obsessed with thaumaturgy. Many of the nobility of Sarn and the Empire were interested in having virtue gems embedded in their skin or implanted surgically like Brutus. These people were called gemlings, and both the Empire's army and its civilians took place in this type of thaumaturgy. A material called thaumatic sulfite was leftover material from refining virtue gems and was used in multiple ways, including as a softening agent for the statues seen in Sarn. When the cataclysm struck, gemling people transformed into these undying, and these statues formed with thaumatic sulfite came to life. Clearly, the link between the cataclysm and thaumaturgy is strong. The marketplace itself is as old as the city of Sarn and the Empire. While the marketplace isn't officially named the Parandus Marketplace, it was founded by the Parandus family and made the family incredibly wealthy. The Parandus family were influential figures in the Empire even before Chittis Parandus became Emperor in 1319 IC. We travel through this marketplace to an area called the Battlefront, in the northeast part of Sarn. The Battlefront connects to the Solaris Temple, the docks, and a bridge to the Ebony Barracks, which has been magically blockaded by the Blackguards. The bridge is guarded by Captain Aurelianus. We kill Aurelianus and take a treasure he was protecting, a ribbon spool, of mysterious origin. While many seasoned players will skip straight to the docks at this point, it makes more sense lore-wise to continue on to the Solaris Temple. The Solaris Temple is one of two temples in Sarn which give worship to the gods Solaris and Lunaris, the sun and the moon. Grigor tells us that the Eternals revered sun and moon as the two eyes of their god, the right eye judging Solaris, the left eye merciful Lunaris. We know that Grigor was caught and experimented on by Piety for trying to find the remains of a person called the Gemling Queen in the Solaris Temple. We search the temple and end up finding more than just remains of the Gemling Queen. She is still alive. This Gemling Queen is a woman named Diala. We can clearly see multiple virtue gems protruding from her head and shoulders. Lady Diala has an interesting way of speaking that is poetic and rambling but her history is absolutely fascinating. Whether her odd behavior is the result of the cataclysm giving her madness, how she's always been, or simply eccentricities from surviving alone for 300 years is hard to say. Lady Diala was one of Emperor Chittis Parandus's mistresses. Apparently, if Chittis got annoyed or tired of a mistress, he would hand that mistress over to his thaumaturgists. Diala was given to Malachi when she lost favor. Malachi, the teacher of both Chevron and Malagaro, embedded the virtue gems into Diala and she became the Gemling Queen. Diala loved Malachi and was willing to do as he asked. Diala tells us that Malachi was massively influential in Chittis Parandus's interest in virtue gems. In Victorio's poems about the monkey king Chittis, the shadow of the king is referring to Malachi. Maybe not so fun fact, during the Purity Rebellion, Diala killed the poet Victorio's lover, Marilyn, as punishment for his writings against the Empire. Malachi told Chittis that these virtue gems could make citizens of the Eternal Empire more eternal. It was with Chittis' approval 
the Malachi was able to enlist students of thaumaturgy and have many thaumaturgical experiments take place across Rayclast. It is shocking that Diala survived not only the Purity Rebellion, but the Cataclysm without turning into an Undying. We find out that Malachi also survived the Purity Rebellion, even though he had been working so closely with the defeated Emperor Chittis. Apparently, Malachi convinced High Templar Vol, leader of the Purity Rebellion, that he could create a device to put an end to all thaumaturgy. Malachi, through his and his students' studies, had discovered the source of thaumaturgy, an entity which Malachi called the Beast. For over a year, Malachi and Diala stayed in this Solaris temple, working on Malachi's invention called the Rapture Device. She tells us that Malachi convinced Vol that the device needed to be taken up north to cleanse Rayclast of thaumaturgy forever. Malachi, Diala, and Vol all traveled to this location with Malachi's rapture device, where Malachi asked Diala to sacrifice herself to complete the rapture. Diala refused, and somehow Malachi's use of the rapture device has caused the cataclysm that has devastated Rayclast. We will learn more details of Malachi and his rapture device in Act 4, but for now we know Diala the Gemling Queen has survived by hiding out in the Solaris Temple. The ribbon spool we found in the battlefront is her device, used to make the living ribbons we have seen floating around and attacking us. Diala refers to us as not a cockroach because she considers these blackguards to be cockroaches who feed on the corpse of a dead empire. Because we return this dangerous spool to Diala, she tells us that we can destroy the undying blockage in the sewers with thaumatic sulfite if we can bring it to her. The same leftover material from refining virtue gems that animates the sculptures of Sarn. Malachi had shipments of thaumatic sulfite come in via the docks. On the docks, we can find the thaumatic sulfite in question, but we also run into a familiar face, Captain Fairgraves. It turns out that Allflame didn't fully work when he tried to kill you in Act 1, and he now exists somewhere between human and ghost, still chained to his ship. He would like you to help him die, because once dead, the Allflame will resurrect him again, hopefully correctly. Fairgraves wants you to collect the Decanter Spiritus and the Chittus Plum for his quest. The Decanter Spiritus is an invention by none other than Malachi. It is a vessel that can turn any liquid quasi-apparitional in nature, as Fairgraves describes. Apparently, Malachi was interested in something called ghost wine, or at least turning regular liquids into something corporeal. The Chittis plum grows from a tree planted over Emperor Chittis's body. We learn through this quest that on the day Vol and his supporters marched on Sarn, Emperor Chittis was stabbed by Lord Ondar, mayor of Sarn. Emperor Chittis was a gemling himself, with a gem implanted above his heart. Book 5 of the Purity Chronicles says that Chittis, empowered with rage and strength from his virtue gem, sliced Ondar in half before he died. The Chittis plums are said to cause great agony and possibly death on consumption. When Fairgraves mixes the Chittis plums juice into the Decanter Spiritus, he is able to drink it. But for some reason, the Allflame has gone out, and we can assume that Fairgraves will not be resurrected after this final, agonizing death. We bring Diala the Thaumatic Sulfite from the docks, and she creates Infernal Talc, which is a substance that can destroy the Undying Blockage. Diala knows that the sewer route will lead us to the Ebony Barracks, which the Blackguards have been barricading. Art fact! Diala knows about the sewer systems because she was given to Malachi when she asked Emperor Chittis where the town's poop went. Seriously. We head back to the Grand Arena. Grigor urges us to find and kill Piety as revenge for Piety deforming and torturing him. We know from Diala and Maramoa that the Blackguards and Piety have been seen with General Gravisius. Gravisius is the current High Templar Dominus's right-hand man. Everyone would like to see General Gravisius dead as well. Gravisius and Piety are working for Dominus on Rayclast, for reasons still unknown, but we now learn that Dominus himself is also on Rayclast, instead of in Oriath. Dominus has set up a thaumaturgical laboratory of his own at the top of the Scepter of God, formerly known as the Chittis Cathedral. Rigor tells us that Dominus gets up and down this tower via elevator, afraid of the monsters inside it, but that the tower itself has been locked. 
Of course, there is the Eternal Labyrinth here and the lore of Ascension, how Chittis Parandus came to power. Um, unfortunately, Act 3 is already jam-packed. There's no way we can squash all of that information into any of the Act videos, so I will be doing a separate video about the lab. We use the Infernal Talc to destroy the undying blockage in the sewers and emerge in the Ebony Barracks on the northwest side of Sarn. Farther west is the Lunaris Temple, where we believe Piety is hiding. We see more blackguards here and run into General Gravisius. Gravisius says some not-so-nice things to us, so it's a pleasure to kill him on everyone's behalf. Unlike the Solaris Temple, which seemed relatively untouched, the Lunaris Temple has been desecrated by the likes of Piety and other Thaumaturgists. The first level has blackguards in it, but also necromancers and the evidence of thaumaturgical experiments. One such experiment is Cole, who is reminiscent of Brutus from Act 1. Cole was Grigor's bunkmate when captured by Gravisius, a rapist from Oriath exiled as punishment. Cole was also one of Piety's experiments, like Grigor, and his similar build to Brutus suggests Piety may have learned something from her studies of Chevron's texts back in the prison in Act 1. As we descend to the second level, the evidence of Piety's thaumaturgy becomes grotesque. The temple is a horror scene. Everything is covered in blood, literal pools of blood taking up the majority of the floor. Poor, failed experiments are impaled on spears amidst the blood pools. Corpses begin piling up on the floor as we make our way through this maze, following the ever-growing carnage leading to piety. Finally, we see her, follow her to the final room, and begin to fight. But who is piety, really? We have chased her around Ray class, trying to stop the havoc she's been causing. Piety was once named Vinia, and was a prostitute and thaumaturgist in Oriath. We know she used to purchase ingredients for her thaumaturgy from Clarissa. Since the short reign of High Templar Vol, after the success of the Purity Rebellion, thaumaturgy has been outlawed in Oriath. The Purity Rebellion was an attempt to fight the monstrosities the Empire's interest in thaumaturgy had created and to purify Rayclast and Oriath. The ruling High Templars since the Rebellion have also stood against thaumaturgy, and Vinya was condemned to death for her crimes. Vinya was brought before High Templar Dominus, and they shared a dinner so Dominus could hear her confession. After this dinner and discussion, Vinya was not killed. Dominus renamed her Piety and became heavily interested in thaumaturgy himself. We ourselves have seen the power of thaumaturgy in the enemies we fight and the virtue gems we use to kill them. The power of thaumaturgy and its potential uses is highly persuasive. Piety has been ordered to gather all the information about thaumaturgy she can from Rayclast and bring that information to Dominus. It was only after Vinya became Piety and inspired Dominus's interest in thaumaturgy that Oriath criminals began being exiled to Rayclast rather than killed. We can speculate this was so Piety had people to experiment on away from Oriath to keep her experiments secret. Judging from the carnage in the Lunaris Temple, Piety has been doing a lot of experimenting. Piety has been learning all she can in particular about Malachi and his works, hence her studies of Chevron, her interest in Malagaro's equipment, and her attempts to find the Gemling Queen in the Solaris Temple. We can now make our way towards the Scepter of God, where Dominus himself likely resides. We now know that Dominus is behind all of Piety's undertakings. The Imperial Gardens lead to the Scepter of God, but also the Sarn Library. The Sarn Library itself is pretty self-explanatory. Inside, however, is a ghost named Siosa, who is attached to a painting of himself. Siosa was a Karui slave who became a scholar and survived the cataclysm by having his spirit bound to this painting. He asks us to find four pages written by Isius Parandus, who was translating Val texts in the library when Siosa was alive. These pages are in the archives, which Siosa cannot reach because he is stuck to a painting. We find the hidden entrance to the archives, begin gathering these golden pages, and find something interesting. The first three pages are written by Isseus, translating Val texts regarding their interests in thaumaturgy and their communion with something called Nightmare. The fourth page is a direct note to Siosa, complimenting Siosa's humanity and saying that his slavery will cause them to overlook you. A rather cryptic message. At the end of the fourth page, Siosa tells us that there is a note from Malachi to Isseus. 
which reads, My dearest Isseus, I have been enlightened beyond expectation. Your work in translating these artifacts is worthy of the highest recompense, and thus I am delighted to offer you a position in my personal laboratory. Please do not give your escorts any consternation. I would be most pained to see such a precious asset damaged in any way. Malachi. Malachi kidnapped Isseus to use him and his knowledge for his work. From what we've seen happen in the laboratories of other thaumaturgists, we can imagine that Isseus did not meet a pleasant end. While Siosa was overlooked for his work in the library because of his background as a Karui slave. Fun fact, the scholar Trinian, the intellectus prime who wrote of the Val and founding of the Empire, is an undying stuck in these archives. We leave Siosa and the library to head to our final destination in Act 3, the Scepter of God. But what is the Scepter of God? It used to be the Chittis Cathedral before the Purity Rebellion. It is actually the site on which Emperor Chittis Parandus was betrayed and murdered by Lord Mayor Ondar. The fact that High Templar Dominus has taken over a cathedral once dedicated to the emperor most embedded in thaumaturgy is no coincidence. Neither Piety nor Dominus actually enter the Scepter of God themselves, but we must enter and fight our way up the tower. The Scepter of God is overrun by gemling creations and creatures. Finally, we get to the top floor and take some stairs to the roof where Dominus waits. Dominus is the current High Templar ruling Oriath, but he is also the person responsible for our exile from Oriath. And now we know why. Beyond our crimes, Dominus has been using exiles as fodder for his and Piety's thaumaturgical experiments. The roof has been transformed into a thaumaturgical laboratory like those we have seen before. Dominus and Piety are convinced that the use of thaumaturgy can bring them closer to God and the betterment of mankind overall. By experimenting on the bad exiles, they could give knowledge back to Oriath. This is why Vinya was spared and became piety, for giving Dominus the vision of leadership through thaumaturgy. Dominus still sees himself as a man of religion, utilizing the tools of thaumaturgy rather than scorning them. Dominus begins the fight relatively normally, using powerful magics to attack us. He screams at us about the power of God, such as SHRINK NOT FROM GOD, or THE TOUCH OF GOD. When it seems we've killed him, he shouts, THIS WORLD IS AN ILLUSION, and resurrects in a monstrous form, a giant bug writhing from the ground with the same mask Dominus had been wearing. Here we witness the true face of Thaumaturgy, I mean God. On killing High Templar Dominus, Diala appears to congratulate us for embracing death and generously sharing it with those that stood in our way. She opens the door to the aqueduct, a channel built to move water, and we follow this aqueduct's path to begin Act 4. Thank you so much for watching, it's your boy Noodle. If you enjoyed the video, you enjoyed this series, please consider subscribing, give this video a like, smash that bell button, if you have any questions or you just want to hang out, feel free to check out my stream, twitch.tv slash kittencatnoodle. And if you want to support or vote on the next videos after we finish the 10 acts, please think about joining my Patreon. But until next time, stay sane, exiles.